hearing me for the first time about the dolphin. So um, we try to always run these updates that we do as updates, but I always try to um, cater for people who haven't been before. So we kind of there's a little bit of repetition for those of you who have been to all the forums, um, but so that everyone can follow what we're doing. Um, yeah, there's a little bit of repetition. Unfortunately, you'll be missing the titles, but the titles are usually nothing too informative. Um, so we started this project in 2016, and it's a project that is in collaboration with Murdoch University and City of Mandra, and then we've um, gathered more partners along the way. So we're working, um, got a grant for the Peel Development Commission um, for our new dedicated boat. We have Mandra Cruises, and then we have also uh, John and Bella Perry, um, who have donated some money, and then the Dolphin Rescue Group, um, which is one of our sponsors, but also like our collaborator. We work very closely together. Um, now, I don't know where I should stand, so you can all see these. Um, so as Barbara mentioned already, so why did we come to study the dolphins in Mandra? So several reasons, one being the stranding. So Mandra is actually considered a mass stranding hotspot for um, dolphins, and especially live strandings. Um, and this is why um, it's very unique in comparison, for example, to the Leshenot or the Swan Canning River Park, where you also have strandings, but not to the same degree as you do here. Um, also, Murdoch University, we had a project running up in Bunbury since 2007 and then in Perth from 2011, although there were some studies in the 90s as well in the Swan Canning River Park. So Mandra was kind of like the natural fill the gap um, space. Um, and so I work together with the people who have worked both in Bunbury and in Perth. Um, so I can match all the animals we observe here to the animals that are, have been seen in, like off the coast of Perth or in the estuary and same in Bunbury. So we kind of like see if the, there's some animal movement um, between the areas. Now, in Mandra, we've had at least 35 live strandings since 1987. <laughs> um, and these have involved about 60 individuals. And I'll tell you later how we've identified a um, uh, sort of resident community of dolphins in the estuary. But out of the resident community that we've identified today, 17 of these animals have at least one stranded. Um, and in the 90s, they don't do this anymore, but if you look at the photos here, we, they actually freeze branded numbers onto the side of the animal's dorsal fin um, to be able to recognize which ones they were. But now we know that all these dolphins can be identified from the natural markings. So all the nicks and notches that you can see in this, this animal, for example, um, these are what we use to identify the individuals. So we take photographs of the dog with the fins and then just match them up, which one is which. So the strandings here, I'm sure everyone's heard sort of global news, national news, when animals strand. Oftentimes they're, str they're stranding for a reason. So they're ill animals, um, are not well. Sometimes, a lot of times we don't know why they're stranded. Um, with some uh, bigger dolphin or whale species, um, whether it's kind of like one is ill and the other is solo, or their navigation is confused or uh, something like this. But in Mandra, most of these strandings, they're actually very healthy animals um, that strand in an area where they, part where they use a lot of their time. So for example, this is a juvenile um, Kristen who was stranded um, earlier this year. Wasn't it? Yes, earlier this year. And um, all the pink dots you see on the map, um, so a lot of the time um, Kirsten spends in the, I keep calling it Kirsten, I had a volunteer whose name is Kirsten, and suddenly this dolphin mer like morphed into Kirsten rather than Kristen. But um, so the star, blue star, is where the animal stranded, and the pink dots are where we've actually seen it. So it's come out of the estuary at times, but most of the time we see it in the estuary. And that's where it's stranded. And once it was uh, rescued by the uh, dolphin rescue group and pushed into deeper water, um, ever since it's with its usual associates, it's doing exactly what it did before. So definitely a healthy animal. Same as, I'll just go back to zero one, is the first ever freeze-branded dolphin that was freeze-branded in 1990. And we still see it today. So if it's stranded because of 
steal their story but, but wasn't doing well or wasn't a viable individual, we wouldn't be seeing it anymore. So there's definitely some other reason for the stranding. Um, so while the animals are stranded, they can actually um, get burned pretty badly in the summer. So in the upper corner, you see one of the estuary resident females called Haley. Uh, this is the picture taken by the dolphin rescue group uh, when it was burnt. And then this one on the left is the same individual. And you can see how uh, remarkably the, the wound has actually um, healed. And it produces this white scarring that is very, um, I guess, unique and particular for the mandra dolphin population. Um, now just quickly, quickly revisiting when we started this project. Um, so you can see on this map, it's our whole study area. So we actually go all the way to Point Perrin and then about 20 kilometers south of uh, Dawesville Hut um, and then cover the estuary um, as well. So we want to see how the estuary animals, how they're connected to the coastal population, whether you have a lot of movement um, and whether you have interbreeding between the individuals that use the estuary and the coastal areas. Now one of our questions that I'll touch a little bit later on is where is the actual population um, or species limit for these animals? So the, in the literature, scientific literature, we don't really know how far off the coast these animals uh, go. And then the species that we study here is um, a bottlenose dolphin and it's Terceus aduncus, which is a subspecies. And then when you go further off the coast, at one point, all the bottlenose dolphins that you have are another subspecies called Terceus truncatus which is particularly more of a, like a deeper water, offshore um, animal. So one of the questions also was that where is actually the limit of this population? Um, to date, so we just finished our two years of uh, sort of intensive effort. We have spent 222 days on water, uh, 1,016 hours. Um, and luckily we've seen a lot of dolphins too. <laughs> um, so we've encountered um, thousands 38 groups of dolphins um, during this time, and all the pink dots that you can see in this map, um, they're all the locations of where we've seen the dolphin groups. And then during the group sightings, where we photograph each individual, we've identified about 500 different individuals. So those are all from the different um, nicks and notches on the dorsal fins. Now, this is a, like, um, Smarties or m and plot. <laughs> so don't worry too much about what color is what. Um, here from all these sightings, we've um, sort of seen that the, the dolphins use the estuary or the Peel Harvey waterway. So it's the estuary inlet, um, both of the channels that go into Dawesville, uh, Cut and Mandra Channel. So they use them year round consistently. And then on the coast, they use the coast year round, apart from, I usually have a stick or something, but um, in this 